Thanks everybody for joining us this morning for the colloquium. <clears throat> it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, uh, Kostas Daskalakis, who's a professor in uh, EECS at MIT. Uh, he's a member of CSAIL with affiliations in LIDS and ORC. Uh, Kostas broadly works on uh, computation theory and its interface with a number of interesting fields, including game theory, economics, uh, and machine learning and statistics. So a good fit for our series this, uh, this quarter. And his work has been recognized by a number of awards, including, uh, of course, but not limited to the ACM Doctoral Disser Dissertation Award and the ACM Grace Marie Hopper Award, as well as the uh, Kale uh, Prize from Ga the Game Theory Society and a Sloan Fellowship in Computer Science. He's also won a number of best paper awards at top conferences, including EC uh, and the Siam Outstanding ba uh, Paper Prize. And he has a uh, uh, also resolved a number of uh, long-standing open questions regarding um, the computational complexity of Nash equilibria. We'll actually hear about hopefully some of that um, today. Um, and he's been currently exploring this sort of intersection between machine learning and game theory. Um, and so, yeah, I'll turn it over to uh, you now, Kosis. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for inviting me to this uh, lecture and uh, to this colloquium. And thank you everybody for being here. Um, so this talk is joint work with uh, Stratis Koulakis, uh, who's a postdoc at SU, uh, as UTD, and Manolo Zambatakis, who was uh, my PhD student and who is currently a uh, postdoc at UC Berkeley. And uh, this work uh, ties together uh, questions uh, uh, around uh, equilibrium uh, computation uh, and questions that arise in uh, deep learning. Uh, uh, when you consider multi-agent uh, learning problems. And um, uh, uh, an example motivation for this talk uh, is uh, um, uh, the following. So uh, as you know, as you know, uh, uh, deep learning has uh, uh, given uh, important advances in game playing. For example, uh, at, at this point, uh, uh, deep learning based methods uh, beat uh, human uh, players in Go and uh, to, to Texas Hold'em. On the other hand, on the, on the right hand side, you see here a, a Waymo car that is trying to uh, enter a highway and it's been antagonized by human agents, uh, so much so that it abandons the attempt to enter the highway and exits the highway and tries again. Uh, and uh, the question is, how is it that uh, deep learning models have risen at the level of human players in very complex games that very few of us uh, know how to play well, uh, while at the same time uh, um, our intelligent machines, so self-driving cars uh, in this case, uh, cannot play other games which many of us can play decently well. And uh, uh, sort of like uh, st stepping back a, a, a little bit, and putting the question in a broader uh, context, um, a lot of the remarkable progress of deep learning uh, that we have seen in the past uh, decades um, owes to the fact that we are able to optimize very complex models. Of course, this is not the only thing. We are also have good models uh, and inductive biases. We have uh, um, uh, uh, good hardware. We have a lot of data. But uh, a lot of the progress is certainly due to the fact that uh, uh, we can optimize a very complex uh, models. And when we say optimize, we mean that uh, in complex uh, optimization landscapes, we have optimization methods that reliably find us uh, good local optima, uh, good local optima. Um, and this is the uh, case where we have a, a learning agent that we want to train to optimize a certain uh, loss function. Uh, however, uh, we have uh, started seeing, and we certainly will uh, face uh, down the line, uh, applications in which uh, several learning agents uh, are present in the same environment, interacting with the environment and consuming data from the environment, but also interacting with each other. And uh, sort of the decisions that agents make uh, influence both the state of the environment uh, and the, uh, their own reward, as well as the reward of the other agents. And um, uh, the question that arises is, 
what uh, DNA are you going to endow your learning agents if they're going to participate in such multi-agent uh, environments? And the practical experience, and this is sort of like the starting point for my talk, is that uh, if you endow each of your agents in such a situation with uh, gradient descent as the method to consume data from the environment and update their uh, uh, decisions, uh, practical experience says that uh, it will have very hard time converging, uh, uh, let alone converging to something meaningful. So what I wanna investigate in this talk is how deep uh, this issue is with gradient descent against gradient descent. And uh, I'm gonna consider the baby version of this question. And in particular, I'm gonna consider two agents that are in direct uh, competition against each other. In other words, I'm gonna consider a mean max problem. So I'm gonna consider two agents, one controlling the X variables and the other controlling the Y variables and uh, uh, an objective function F, X and Y uh, which uh, uh, the one of the players wants to minimize while the other player wants to maximize. So they're in direct competition. They're controlling par parts of the uh, arguments of the objective function. One wants to minimize it, one wants to maximize it. Okay. Of course, we all know applications of min-max uh, optimization in classical problems in optimization, as well as recent applications in, uh, in deep learning, such as uh, uh, GANs, um, adversarial training more generally to agent reinforcement learning and, 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 and other things. Uh, so now, um, um, uh, the types of applications that we're interested in are uh, involving uh, uh, high dimensional X's and Y's and functions F that uh, aren't typically nice and uh, you know the method of choice, of course, is to have both our agents run gradient descent to optimize their objectives. Of course, one player is trying to maximize; he's going to be running gradient ascent. So the dynamics that we typically try to do to to run a facing a problem like the one on the left hand side is uh, some variation of gradient descent ascent. So you have both agent; each agent run gradient descent. Uh, against each other. Uh, potentially you play with, you know, the learning rates that the agents use. Maybe you don't run vanilla gradient descent, you run something more complex, but like uh, in quotes, uh, at least, uh, this is what you do to solve these types of problems. And um, practical experience says that uh, gradient descent ascent has a, you know, a pretty hard time uh, uh, converging in, in these types of scenarios. I'm not going to dive too much into the examples, but you know, people who you know have practical experience uh, with GANs will believe me that a grand ascent ascent is not a very stable algorithm. So just just to give an example here, let's look at the bottom panel. So in the in the, bo in the bottom panel, we see a target distribution that's a mixture of Gaussians whose means are arranged in a, a, on a cycle. And what you see on the right hand side is what happens uh, if I stop a gun training at uh, different steps of the training procedure? Uh, so what I'm looking at is what distribution the generator is uh, generating at different, if I, if I were to stop the training at different steps. And you see that the generator is going from mode to mode uh, uh, of the distribution. So basically what's happening there is that uh, the two players of the gun, the generator and the discriminator are doing, um, I don't know, like a, they're playing like a, a mouse and cat game. So the generator goes somewhere, generates there, then discriminator comes and like, like so uh, that, you know, they're, they're chasing around, around each other on the cycle of the Gaussian, no, on the, on the, on the, on, on this cycle. So this is the typical sort of like uh, experience with uh, gradient descent ascent in min max problems. Uh, but you don't need to go too far to see that gradient descent ascent is not a good method. Okay, so uh, here I'm showing you the simplest possible example of a min max problem, and uh, uh, already there, gradient descent ascent fails. So, in particular, I took here an objective that is x times y, both scalars. That function has a unique uh, min max uh, solution, which is the zero, zero point, unless both of these agents are zero. 
uh, the other side can exploit them. So both of them have to be zero at the min max equilibrium. But if I run gradient descent ascent, which degenerates in this very simple dynamic here uh, to solve this uh, problem, what I see is this spiraling out behavior. So the equilibrium is here, but the uh, GDA dynamics are spiraling around and away from the min max equilibrium. So these are some simple example of what's going on uh, in, in, in these settings. And uh, just to summarize, uh, training oscillations and garbage solutions arise even in two agent zero sum settings, uh, even when the objective function is convex concave. So it falls under the umbrella of von Neumann's uh, min max theory. Uh, even when the objective, the variables are low dimensional, and even when the function is perfectly known to the, to the optimization procedure. So, of course, uh, you know, the uh, uh, real life story uh, wherein you have multiple agents, non convex objectives, uh, high dimensional variables, and when the function is not known to the optimizer, is going to be a much harder story. So the, the goal of this talk is to dive into the structure of this min-max optimization problem and understand uh, um, how complex uh, it is from an optimization standpoint. Um, yeah. Uh, and in particular, it's uh, instructive to compare the min-max optimization problem to the minimization problem. As I was saying in the beginning of the talk, minimization, being able to find local optimal, local minima uh, for problems that look like the left-hand side has been driving progress in deep learning in uh, recent years. Uh, so uh, the question is how much harder uh, it is to insert a max player into the picture. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to compare these two problems and tell you what we know and not, do, not, do not know about these problems. And for my talk, I'm, I'm gonna be assuming that F is Lipsitz and smooth. And I'm gonna take the constraint set to be a convex and compact set. Uh, and in my comparison, I'm gonna start uh, the story in the nice, in the classical setting. So in the classical setting, what you wanna see on the left-hand side is a convex function. Uh, what you wanna see on the right-hand side is a convex in x and concave in y function. That, that's the nice setting for these two problems. And uh, in this classical setting, there are a lot of links between the left and the right hand side, of course, because of convex programming duality. And in particular, there's not much difference in terms of uh, 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 our ability to optimize the left or the right hand side. So uh, in both cases, uh, there are first order methods. I mean, there are a lot of other methods, but in particular, there are first order methods like gradient descent, uh, which uh, find approximate minima um, in a number of steps and queries to the function and or, and or its gradient that are polynomial in the approximation that you're shooting for, the smoothness and the diameter of the constraint set. Um, and, and just to be, you know, clear about what types of local approximate minimum I'm, I'm talking about on the left, I'm talking about points X star such that, oops, such that no other point can decrease the function by more than epsilon. What I mean by approximate min max equilibrium on the right are points X star Y star so that no unilateral, no, no change of the X player to some other, from X star to some other X can decrease the function by more than epsilon. No change of Y star to something else that's feasible can increase the function by more than epsilon. This is what I mean by local minimax equilibrium. It's a natural notion. Um, so again, in the classical setting, there's no real difference between the complexity of the problem on the left and the problem on the right. And then the question that arises is how should I consolidate this thing with the fact that I already told you that even for this trivial function, GDA doesn't converge. How do you consolidate the fact that 
you know, this is an easy problem. Nevertheless, gradient send ascent is cycling. Uh, well, the, the way to consolidate that is simple to say, uh, well, GBA is not the right method in this case. Like if you're looking for a method that uh, shows last iterate convergence, that's not gradient descent, but, but there's no inherent complexity barrier that you have to cross to uh, uh, solve the problem on the right hand side. Uh, the fact that GDA is cycling in this convex concave case is an artifact of not using the right method. And what I want to discuss a little bit in a, in a, a, a little bit uh, in uh, next uh, in, 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 in a little bit in a little bit is uh, that there is a way to fix this issue. Okay. Uh, but the summary is that the, the convex concave setting is a nice setting. And if you pay a little bit more attention to what method you, you, you are using, you can avoid the oscillations that GDA is showing. And this wraps up the story for uh, convex concave. I will revisit to tell you how to fix the oscillation issue. Uh, but uh, for now, that, that wraps up the comparison in the classical setting. Of course, the modern setting does not involve uh, convex functions on the left or convex concave functions on the right. And uh, you know what do we know in this case? Well, we know that if you're searching for globally optimal solutions, of course, the problems then be hard. So you cannot minimize, you cannot minimize functions, let alone min maximize functions. Uh, but deep learning is not shooting for a global optima, they're shooting for local optima. So the question is, what is the complexity of finding local minima on the left, local min max solutions on the right? Well, let's first define local solutions, uh, the types of local solutions we're gonna be looking at. Uh, uh, I'm gonna be calling a point X star an epsilon delta local minimum. If uh, you cannot decrease the function, if at X star, you cannot decrease the function by more than epsilon. If you, log if you look in a, a ball of radius delta around X star, you can think of it as a approximate fixed point of the, uh, uh, of the a projected gradient iteration. Okay, so you intersect your ball with a feasible set, no move there can improve you by more than uh, epsilon. The similar thing happens on the right hand side. So an X star Y star in a, is an epsilon delta local min max if you cannot unilaterally change X star in a feasible delta ball around X star to decrease the function by more than epsilon, which is the left right inequality. You, similarly, you cannot change Y star in a feasible ball around you to increase the function by more than epsilon. And again, this uh, another way to view this is it is a uh, approximate fixed point of the gradient descent ascent iteration. Um, and uh, sort of like for my discussion, I'm also going to normalize the function f in zero one to make the discussion simpler. So uh, okay, so uh, and uh, another thing I would like to point out is that the type of local min max solution I'm looking at here uh, uh, targets the uh, uh, simultaneous game. So so I'm thinking of min max players are symmetric. Uh, uh, th there are uh, um, local uh, min max. Uh, uh, concepts you can define targeting the sequential, like a sequential view uh, of, of this game. Uh, um, but but for this talk, I'm going to focus on the simultaneous move uh, game. So this is why this definition here is symmetric for X and Y. There's no real difference uh, um, between X and Y in terms of how the, the solution concept looks like. Uh, but there are solution concepts that target the sequential version of the problem which I'm not going to get into. So now, OK, so these are the local solutions that we're targeting. What do we know about computing them? Well, on the left, uh, if you're not too greedy, you can still find those solutions. Okay, So 
uh, so if delta is small enough as a function of epsilon and the smoothness of the uh, function, uh, first order methods can find you such solutions in a number of steps that are polynomial uh, in the natural parameters again, approximation and smoothness of the function. If you become too greedy, of course, you will make your, you will turn your left hand side problem into a global optimization problem. And of course that's gonna be NP hard. So Delta has to remain small for you to have any chance of solving it. The moment you grow your radius in which you look for deviations to be too large, uh, the problem becomes a global optimization problem because it becomes NP hard, okay? But uh, this is the, the natural threshold of Delta. Uh, for in, in which the problem is actually local, all right? Uh, okay, so, but uh, you know, if you, uh, if you uh, uh, are okay with local solutions, uh, then, uh, you know, despite the fact that F is not convex, uh, you can solve the left-hand side problem. No, no problem there, okay? So you turned your solution concept from a global to a local solution concept. And uh, now first order methods work. They can find you such things in polynomial time. So what happens on the right-hand side? Well, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, do these things exist? Uh, my first uh, little claim uh, is not hard to show by, by Brouwer fixed points, by Brouwer fixed point theorem, is that uh, these local things exist uh, if delta is small enough, the same, the same notion of small enough. Okay, so these things that I'm shooting for are not exotic things that may or may not exist. They do exist. They are guaranteed to exist by Brouwer Fixman theorem. So, and that's a good thing, right? I mean, you know, I'm trying to solve this non convex, non concave, min max optimization problem. At the very least, I should be targeting things that do exist, right? Because I don't want to be like the moment uh, your target solution concept may or may not exist, your problem is MP hard. So, uh, this solution concept exists, so it's a good target. It's a good first target for optimization method. But the complexity is not well understood, even for this very local solution concept. It does exist, but the complexity is not well understood. And uh, I claim that training oscillations here could actually be related to interactability. All right. So the training oscillations that happen in GANs could relate to the intractability of uh, the solution concept. And that I wanna investigate. So I wanna understand, is it intractable? Because if it's intractable, uh, you know, why do you hope that first order methods will find it, okay? So that, that, is, that, is, that will be the main focus of this talk. All right. So just to summarize where we are so far, uh, uh, what I wanna do is I wanna understand the difference between minimization and min maximization. And I, 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 I'm gonna consider two settings. The nice setting where oscillations are an artifact of using the wrong method and the difficult setting uh, where you have non-convex, non-concave objectives where oscillations may not be an artifact of using the wrong method, but there could be like a strong reason why you see those oscillations in practice. Uh, and I wanna shed light on these two things, All right? So the first one is how to remove the oscillations in the convex concave case, which is a nice case. And the second thing I wanna sh shed light on is, is there a complexity barrier that is preventing first order methods or, or more general methods from finding even local min-max equilibria in, in the case of non-convex, non-concave objectives. These are the two uh, things I wanna to study today. Any questions so far about the plan? I have one, Costas. Uh, uh, are you also interested in, in settings where like you sort of have, you don't have anything too flat unless it's a situation you're happy about? I think Mariam actually asked about saddle points too. So so like an oh, upper right. bound on your on your derivative, but like do you also maybe like guarantee that you don't have like weird flat points? 
Uh, so, sorry, I, I actually didn't see the question on the chat. Uh, she was just asking, would you be happy with a saddle point on the left-hand side of your previous? Are you happy finding a saddle point? On the left, on the minimization side? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the non-convex non case? Yeah, I'm looking at, I'm looking at uh, like, uh, um, I have a, like the way I wrote it there is for even for like, yeah, even that compromise is cool for me, like gradient zero points are cool with me, right? So, uh, so I would be happy with the, uh, um, right, so, oops, coming back to the previous slide, uh, this thing here allows for zero gradient points. And this thing allows for zero gradient points, both of them. So, uh, and, and since we're looking at the complexity of this thing, this is a, very weak compromise, right? So like starting the complexity of this problem is like a very uh, weak uh, straw man for, you know, what would be a better solution concept. So, uh, and that's why we set the bar very low and see if we can at least uh, uh, reach that bar. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank, thanks a lot, that, that helps the discussion. Um, all right, so let's dive into the convex concave case. It's going to last only a couple slides because the main focus will be on the non-convex, non-concave case. Again, this is a nice case, but uh, even for trivial functions that are convex concave, you see this oscillation of gradient descent ascent. And uh, what I want to understand a little bit is what is the, what is the issue with uh, gradient descent ascent? Especially in view of the fact that Gradient descent ascent, online gradient descent is a non-regret, is a no-regret learning method. And we know that no-regret learning methods converge in zero-sum games if they're convex and cave. So why is it like, how is it that online gradient descent is a no-regret learning method, but it oscillates rather than converging to the to the equilibrium? And I claim that the, the, the reason is that the inherent reason is that no regret learning methods converge to equilibria in convex concave zero sum games only in an average kind of sense. Uh, in the sense that the average of their trajectory converges to the equilibrium of a convex concave function. But of course that doesn't imply that the last iterate converges. And this is very much like the convergence of the moon to the earth. Right, so the moon is going around the earth and it uh, converges to the earth in the sense that its average trajectory converges to the earth. But of course the moon does not crash into the earth which would be what we would like, right? Like, uh, I, mean, or, I mean, okay, some of us would like, I guess. Um, uh, that, that was a joke. Uh, uh, but uh, so the, let's, let's investigate, okay? So why doesn't the moon crash into the earth? Okay, why does, why does it go around? The reason the moon goes around the earth is that it has uh, a momentum that makes it go around the earth, right? So the, 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 if I investigate sort of like what gradient descent ascent does in this uh, function, uh, uh, what's happening is that the gradient descent ascent uh, uh, iteration is pushing it uh, further and further away from the target. And if you would like to correct uh, uh, this dynamic, of course, what you would like to correct is the momentum that the dynamic has, right? Uh, the, the dynamic is pushing it further and further out. So you would like to, to, to counter that. And um, one way that, uh, uh, um, you know, we proposed doing that uh, a few years ago is, is, is by appealing to uh, a classical method uh, in optimization, going back to Popov, uh, called optimistic gradient descent ascent, which what it does is it undo it it undoes the gradient push uh, from yesterday at, uh, at today, right? So rather than doing my standard gradient descent for the minimizing player, I'm also undoing with half the learning rate yesterday's uh, gradient push. And for the maximizing player, again, I am undoing with half the learning rate uh, yesterday's gradient for that player. And the effect of that on my in my little picture here is that today, right, so I'm here, uh, this would be my gradient normal, gradient descent ascent push normally. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take half of yesterday's gradient and add it to that with a minus sign. 
Well, effectively, what it does, it corrects my dynam my momentum, and it makes me crash into the target. And you can you can show that, okay? Uh, so you can get the moon to crash into the into the Earth uh, if, if you correct the momentum this way. So, um, as I said, this optimistic gradient descent ascent method goes back to the eighties, actually, to uh, a Popov's paper. And it's intricately related to another standard method that goes back even further to Korpelevich's uh, paper from the 70s. And both of these methods are known to asymptotically exhibit last iterate convergence in uh, convex concave problems. So uh, what recent years have seen is trying to investigate the rates that these methods uh, uh, exhibit uh, uh, in converging to min-max equilibria or convex concave problems. So we have seen a lot of work in the unconstrained setting, figuring out the rates that these methods exhibit for different kinds of convex concave objectives, bilinear, uh, strongly convex, strongly concave, and so on and so forth. What is not very clear in this literature yet is the rates that these or other related methods exhibit in the constraint setting. So if you're a student or uh, you know, a researcher looking for a uh, interesting open question in that area, the rates for the constraint setting for last iterate convergence are not well understood. Uh, and certainly we're not nowhere near the rates that we know for average, uh, uh, average iterate convergence, all right? So this is what we know in the convex concave setting, but certainly we have methods that have asymptotic uh, last iterate convergence, and we understand the rates of these methods in uh, the unconstrained setting, and we, you know, people are working out the rates in the constrained setting, but that's still a bit open at this point. So that's a little summary of how to correct the dynamics so that you get this last iterate convergence to the target. All right, so if you're facing a convex concave problem and you want to remove your oscillations of gradient descent ascent, add a little bit of negative momentum uh, using one of these two methods or uh, you know, a family of related methods and you will get uh, last iterate convergence. You will remove the oscillations of gradient descent ascent. So these are good news. Um, but, okay, so the main question is what happens in the non-convex, non-concave setting, which is what I want to study next. Any questions about this chapter? Because I'm going to close it uh, uh, for my talk at least. Okay, so it looks like people are happy with the story. Okay, uh, let me jump to the non-convex, non-concave setting now. All right, and let me remind you where we are. We're making a comparison of minimization problems and min-maximization problems when the function f isn't convex or convex concave. And we're targeting these local solutions on the left and the right, which uh, as you correctly pointed out, are first order solutions, okay? Now, for these further first order solutions, we know that if you're not too greedy about the radius in which you're looking at, on the left, you can find them in polynomial time. On the right, the complexity, they exist, which is good, at least they exist, uh, but their complexity is unclear. And this is what I wanna look into. So the main result that I wanted to present is that uh, even though we have set, as, a, as, as we're discussing earlier, the bar quite low, so we're shooting for first order local min max things. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, first order methods will need an exponential number of queries to your function and its gradient. Uh, to find such solutions. 
even though these solutions are guaranteed to exist in the regime that I'm looking at, delta is small enough. And the exponential dependence is exponential in at least one of the relevant parameters of the problem. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's exponential in at least one of the one over the approximation, the smoothness, uh, uh, or the dimensionality of the problem. So in other words, what we do in our proof, we take all these parameters to be polynomial in the dimension. So we cannot distinguish who is the culprit, but we know that it's exponential in at least one of them. The number of steps, you need, the number of queries you have to make. And this result is unconditional, right? So there's, there's no complex the theoretic assumption. Like, like unconditionally, any first order method, any method that accesses the function by querying the function values or the gradient function values will have to make an exponential number of queries to find a local min max solution. This unconditional result is a corollary of a complexity theoretic result that we show, which says that the problem of finding such solutions is PPD complete. So it is um, complete for a particular complexity class that is called PPAD. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, the, in a little bit. But um, uh, another corollary of this complexity theoretic uh, result is that any algorithm, whether it is first order or second order or whatever, will have to make super polynomial number of steps to find uh, these local solutions unless there is a complexity, complexity class collapse. So P pad collapses into P. Uh, and in particular, um, the complexity theoretic result is for white box access to the function. So you can look inside the function, you know the details of the function, you don't have bl only black box access to it. You're given, a, you know, you're given the code that computes the function. So the complexity theoretic result is for white box access to the function. And it says, no matter what you want to do, you will have to make super polynomial number of steps to find local min max solutions. The previous result, this one, uh, is a black box result. So if you have black box access to the function and you access the function and the gradient by queries to an oracle, uh, you will have to make exponential number of steps. So uh, these types of results are more standard in optimization literature, uh, while uh, these types of results are more standard in uh, TCS. So, but here you have a case where, uh, um, and that, that's sort of like, uh, um, as I'm gonna discuss in a little bit, is an interesting uh, uh, way to prove black box results. So you first prove a white box result like we do here. And then as a corollary, actually, you can get your black box result uh, uh, that we show here, which is you know, more standard in optimization. All right, so to put a little bit the complexity theoretic result into context for those who haven't seen PPAD before, this, this new class that I'm introducing here. So PPAR is a complexity class that was introduced in the 90s by Christos Pavarimitriou. And it lies between P and uh, NP. As you know, P contains problems like solving linear programs. NP contains a lot of problems, including the travel and salesman problem. And PPAD is a class that's in the middle and it captures uh, problems, uh, uh, fixed point problems like finding uh, fixed points of Lipschitz functions, uh, Nash equilibria in general sum normal form games, and several other problems in, um, with a topological flavor, such as Sperner's lemma for the problem, like, uh, yeah, Sperner's problem and so on and so forth. So what we show is that finding uh, Min max equilibria local min max equilibria of non convex non concave functions is PPD complete, which means that it is at least as hard and exactly as hard as these other problems. Right? So, even though we have a zero sum game, the fact that the objective function is non convex concave uh, makes it as hard as uh, uh, games in PIPA that are 
multiplayer and general sum. Okay, so, uh, and as hard as finding broader fixed points. So we characterize, in other words, the complexity of the problem as being equivalent to this equivalence class of problems that contains many other interesting and difficult uh, problems. Next, what I would like to do is to give you a flavor of how we prove the result and how, I don't know, uh, all this complex theoretical machinery and why uh, it shows up. But before that, I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna give you a little bit of an intuition for you know, why you should expect min max to be harder than min minimization, okay? And to give you that intuition, I wanna compare uh, two types of games. Uh, the min max problem that we're looking at in this talk and a min min game. So a game where you have two players, but rather than competing, one trying to minimize an objective and one trying to maximize it, they both want to minimize it. So that's a min min game. Okay, and I want to understand how uh, uh, best response dynamics in, in these two games may look like and what uh, conclusions uh, may I be able to draw from best response dynamics in these two types of games. And here I'm showing you on the left and the right two examples of how best response dynamics may look like in a min min game and a min max game. So for my picture, uh, you know, moves along one axis are gonna belong to one player and moves along the other axis are gonna belong to the other player, okay? So in a, uh, and here I'm showing you best response, the function value, the objective function value along a best response dynamic path in a min-min game and in a min-max game where the vertical axis belongs to the maximizing player and the horizontal axis belongs to the minimizing player. So in a min-min game on a best response dynamics path, the objective value should be dropping at every step, right? Whether the step is horizontal or vertical because both players have the same objective. They both want to minimize the function value, right? So like if the horizontal uh, player likes going from this point to that point, it means that the function value better drop from this point to that point, right? Similarly, when the vertical player goes from this point to that point, it better be that the function value decreases between this point and that point. So in the best response dynamic path of a min-min game, the objective value better be dropping all along the way. All right. On the other hand, in a min max problem, you can be cycling through three values as I'm showing in this example. And this is consistent with having a best response path, right? So like, yeah, the horizontal player improves the, like decreases the function from three to two to one. Then the maximizing player in increases the function from one to two to three. Then the minimizing player goes from three to two to one, one to three, three to one, one to three, right? So like you can get this very long, you know, space filling curve like uh, best response paths and cycling only through three values of the objective function. So what is the conclusion of this? And, and also in a min max problem, you can even have cycles in the best response paths, right? So three to one, one to three, three to one, one to three, right? And you'll be going through the cycle. You can yet get a cycle in best response dynamics paths in a min min problem, right? Because the function value ought to be decreasing along the cycle and you cannot get a cycle with decreasing values. So what is the, what is the idea here? So the idea is that in a min min problem, if in a long best response path, I query the function value, there is memory. I, I, you know, I understand where in the path I'm located, okay? Uh, I cannot implement a very long best response path that is space filling, right? Without having memory, right? Because, uh, you know, you have a space filling best response path and, you know, you query it somewhere, you have to know where exactly in the path you write to assign the value there. While in the, in the, uh, while in the other side, you don't need memory. Like you can be, as I said, you could be cycling through three values of the objective function and you do implement your space filling curve. And this, 
existence or lack of memory is in the heart of what distinguishes the complexity of these two problems. Because if you think about the arguments for how you prove that gradient descent works in a minimization problem, it's a potential function argument. You argue that as you're making steps of the gradient, you're decreasing the function value, right? Until you hit a bottom, right? So you sometimes you assume that you know the function values are constrained into a, from zero to one. So because you're decreasing the function every time you make a big gradient step, you know you have to hit the bottom at some point, right? Uh, on the on the min max side, you could be cycling through, through three values, and you know you get no info like. Where is the potential function you're improving? Nowhere, right? You're cycling through, through three values, no memory, okay? And the fact that you gain no information by querying this message from path uh, at some point about where in the path you're at is what reveals the nature of the beast. The fact that it's not as, as easy as a min-min problem, okay? Now, to take that intuition and convert it into a uh, a lower bound, it wasn't very easy for us, okay? So we tried to implement these space filling curves, right? We're cycling through three values, but then we had to fill, we had to also assign values in the ambient space, right? We're in this space filling curve, uh, you know, lies. Uh, in such a way that we don't create spurious min-max solutions, right? So we would like, we would like to create an instance where you have a, space filling curve of best response dynamics of the min max problem and, and such that the only solutions are at the at the end of this space filling curve but whenever we try to put the space filling curve inside some ambient space and assign function values in the ambient space we would create min max spurious min max solutions that could be identified by first order methods so we couldn't implement this very nice idea we had uh, uh, directly. And this is where we had to appeal to the PPAD machinery because PPAD machinery, the, 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 the topological machinery, you know, uh, behind PPD enabled us to um, implement that construction, right? Because by trying to prove a PPD completeness reduction, we had to start with a topological problem and reduce the topological problem to our mean max uh, problem. And because this topological problem we started with had some topological structure in it, uh, uh, it allowed us to eliminate these spurious solutions that were appearing whenever we tried to do a direct uh, construction. So I don't have too much time, uh, but let me attempt at kind of like give you some intuition about uh, the topological problem that we used and, 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 and how that enables, uh, you know, some structure that avoids these superior solutions from the construction. And, you know, it's a, of independent interest in case you haven't seen it. Uh, it's called Sperner's Lemma. And it says the following. So take a grid, triangulate it, and color the vertices of the triangulation with three colors, uh, uh, red, yellow, and blue. But importantly, you have to color, you have to respect this coloring of the boundary, right? So you, you have full freedom for how to color the internal vertices, but all but this vertex at the bottom should be red, all but this vertex of the left edge must be yellow and the rest of the boundary must be blue. Other than that, you're free to do whatever you want in the middle. Sperner's lemma says that no matter what you did, for example, this colors here, uh, there must be a trichromatic triangle. And in fact, there must be an odd number of trichromatic triangles. And if you look carefully in this picture, you'll see that there are exactly five trichromatic triangles. Now I'm showing you Sperner's, Sperner's lemma in two dimensions. There is a version in three dimensions, in four dimensions, in any, in any dimension. So in dimension D, you're gonna be coloring with D plus one colors and you're gonna be looking for uh, D plus one chromatic simplices. But the simplest, the simplest story is in 2D. So here it is. So in 2D, I'm coloring with three colors. And uh, the claim is that no matter how you color the internal vertices of the grid, there will be a trichromatic 
triangles, in fact, are not the number of them. Now, the way you prove the theorem reveals the topological uh, nature of the problem at hand. And here's the proof. So what you do for the proof is you create an artificial triangle uh, outside of the square. Uh, and you color this vertex blue. So you created an artificial uh, trichromatic triangle. That's a fake one, okay? But uh, you can always create it because uh, the band, no matter what you color the internal vertices with, the boundary is, uh, is this coloring. So by creating this triangle, you always create your artificial trichromatic triangle there. And what you want to do is you want to, in your proof, you want to view this as a factory with triangular rooms, and you're going to be walking in this factory. And you're going to start your walk at this artificial uh, triangle that you created, which is trichromatic. Now, the way you're going to be walking in this factory is you're going to be crossing red, yellow edges. And, uh, and you're going to be crossing red, yellow edges, keeping yellow on your left and red on your right. So if you do so, you enter into, you know, starting from that uh, bottom left triangle there, you enter into a new room. Okay, now this room, well, the other pillar is red. And in particular, it creates another red yellow door you can cross with yellow on your left, which is what you do. Now the question is, what is this pillar color? That's your choice, you color that thing. But if you colored it blue, what happens? So I entered into the room through a red yellow door and I find a blue. Okay, so I found my trichromatic triangle, right? But okay, so say you're trying to fool me, okay? So you say, okay, I'm not gonna color it. I'm gonna color it red or yellow, okay? No matter what you did, red or yellow, in this case, yellow, you created another door I can cross with yellow on my left, which is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be greedily crossing doors, red, yellow doors with yellow on my left, right? Querying your coloring along the way until I, I, you know, I have to stop. And the only way I can stop is if I enter into a room through a red, yellow door and I see a blue. If I don't see a blue, I can keep going, right? And uh, in this case, I arrived at a, at a trichromatic triangle. Now, this is a proof that there is a trichromatic triangle. But it's not a complete proof because I have to argue first of all that you know you're not going to exit the factory. But maybe I'm I'm wandering in the factory and I exit it. Okay, but I can't exit. Why? Because there are no red yellow doors on the boundary. This is why the boundary coloring is important. No red yellow doors on the boundary means no escape for me. Okay, so I cannot escape. And unless I enter into a room through a red yellow door, I see a blue, I can keep going. So the only other failure mode for my proof is what? That I get into a row shape, right? So I, I wander a little bit and then I get into a row shape and I keep going around. But to get a row shape in place, at the junction point of the row shape, you need a room with three red yellow doors. And, and trust me, you cannot create uh, uh, triangular rooms with three red yellow doors. So I cannot exit, I cannot get into a row shape. There's a finite number of rooms, so I have to stop. And the only stopping condition is to find a blue. And this is a proof that there is a trichromatic triangle. To prove that there is a not number of them, it's not a big deal either, okay? So the way you do is you use you know, graph theory. Uh, so basically what you do is you uh, define a directed graph uh, between triangles. The nodes of the graph are triangles and you put a directed edge from some triangle to another if they share a red yellow door that you can cross uh, to go from A to B with yellow on your left. So that defines a directed graph on my factory on, on this thing. And the point is that all points, all, all nodes of that directed graph that are unbalanced, so they have different in and out degree, must be trichromatic. And these are the only trichromatic ones. Okay, so my graph is a directed graph uh, uh, and, all, uh, and, and the, the only trichromatic triangles are the unbalanced vertices of that directed graph. 
And parity, the parity lemma on the, on the, on the directed graph says that these things are, are an, an even number. In a, in a directed graph, there is an even number of uh, nodes that are unbalanced. So I must have an even number of trichromatic triangles. One of them, though, is under artificial. Right? It's the one I created. So there is an odd number of them. So the nature of the beast is the parity argument in directed graphs. Okay. But importantly, if I give you a circuit that, you know, similar to, you know, what we do with first order methods in optimization, if, you, if I give you a circuit that if you query it, it gives you the color of a point, it is PPD complete to find a trichromatic triangle. And if you have, in fact, if you have black box access to it, you can prove it takes expo exponentially many queries to find the trichromatic triangle. If you have white box access to it, it's PPD complete to find a trichromatic triangle. But importantly, and this will be my starting point for the reduction into min max. But importantly, starting from Sperner already comes with some topological structure in my problem that will eliminate spurious solutions that you would see if you try to do it directly, if you try to do the construction directly, right? So you start have to start with, from some problem with structure so that uh, you don't get uh, to create, you know, solutions that you didn't want to have. And you inherit all the, all the complexity results and also all the exponential query lower bounds you know uh, for this problem. So this is what we do. So what we do is we start with an arbitrary instance of this Sperner problem. You're given a circuit that outputs the colors of any point you query. You want to find a trichromatic triangle. So we want to reduce that problem to min max optimization for non-convex, non-concave objectives. So what you do is you define a game between two players. One player is choosing a triangle. Uh, uh, the, the maximizing player is choosing a triangle. The minimizing player is choosing an edge of that triangle. And uh, the way uh, the function value is defined um, is the, um, is the, depends on uh, whether uh, the triangle chosen by the Y player has a red yellow edge and whether uh, the X player chose a red yellow edge in that triangle and also the orientation of the edge in that triangle. So, um, and the goal is that the best response dynamics uh, of the resulting game simulate these paths in my Sperner graph that I was talking about earlier, which can be very, very, very long. And this is why the query complexity of the problem is, is difficult, right? So, you know, like the, the situation looks like you know, if the Y player chooses this triangle and the X player chooses that edge, then you assign function value one. And that gives incentive to the edge player to switch to the other edge of the triangle that is red yellow to, mean to decrease the function. But then that gives incentive to the triangle player to switch triangles. So players are gonna be pivoting uh, between edges, like flipping edges within the triangle or flipping triangles around the edge simulating in their best response dynamics the uh, long path that you can create in the Sperner graph. This is all meant, was all meant to be very impressionistic, uh, but I'm going to be uh, returning to my main thread and trying to conclude here with a philosophical corollary, okay? And the philosophical corollary is this, that uh, we cannot base multi-agent deep learning on the same paradigm that we use for single-agent deep learning, which was write down a clever model, collect a ton of data, get access to a supercomputer, and 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 you know uh, train it to death using gradient descent. That, that's not going to work in the multi-agent setting because even the low bar that I set, which was first-order local min-max solutions, which were <laughs> A two player game, zero sum, and I set a very low bar, uh, it's intractable. So I think that to get around that intractability, we have to do a lot more work in terms of modeling the, the situation in hand, choosing uh, a good learning model with the right inductive bias, deciding what is a meaningful solution concept that I should be targeting, and then developing the optimization algorithm that computes that target solution concept. And I, I think that only then we will get more successes that like the AlphaGo algorithm, which incidentally used game theory 
um, uh, in its guts. Uh, whoops, what did I do? Uh, uh, so, so in the guts of the alpha algorithm, they use Monte Carlo tree search, which is a method to solve uh, turn-based uh, uh, zero-sum games uh, that are complete information. So uh, even that success used game theory in it. So it was not just uh, you know blindfolded deep learning. Okay. All right, so that's basically it. Uh, Min-max optimization, of course, is a very uh, traditional classical field, uh, uh, but but uh, but I, I do think that uh, the applications uh, and equilibrium computation, but I do think that applications will explode in the future when we consider multi-agent uh, learning problems. And uh, again, um, uh, we have to work uh, uh, with domain experts. Uh, uh, to develop the right uh, solution concepts and the right uh, inductive biases and the right formulations of our problems because we, be, before we get uh, more, more successes. And uh, that, that's an ongoing uh, uh, work and uh, uh, um, you know, there are lots of opportunities uh, that are arising on the, on, on, in that space. Uh, th thank you very much. Thanks for the, the great talk. Uh, so I think we have time for a couple questions. Uh, if folks want to ask, please uh, unmute yourself and uh, go for it. I have a, I have a question. Uh, hi, this is Mariam Fazel. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Uh, quick question. So the complexity result is only for best response dynamics, right? So if one modifies that dynamics even a bit, that complexity isn't uh, applicable. Uh, no, not actually. So the proof uh, uses at an intuitive level, uh, you know, the you know, the, 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 you know, uh, uh, how um, best response dynamics uh, work and what they're trying to simulate in the Spurner instance. But the result is clean. It says that you know, if you want to find, no matter what you do, oh. if you want to find this uh, local, uh, uh, you know, uh, first order local min max equilibrium, equilibria. Uh, uh, it's intractable. So mm -hmm. yeah, you can use whatever uh, the unconditional result is, whatever first order dynamic you want to use. Uh, for the black first order dynamics. For the unconditional result and the white box result is any method, you know, you can look at the code of computing the function and the gradient and say, oh, you know, I have some intuition that min max solutions may lie in this part of the space. And uh, mm. whatever you do, uh, it's intractable. Yeah, we don't restrict you for what method you use. I see, I see. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I've got another question. So yeah. so this is looking for like single points, which are, are local equilibria in some sense. Uh, maybe I just didn't think about it enough, but does this say anything about like a correlated equilibrium? Uh, yeah, so the that's a great question. Uh, uh, so in a sense, uh, what we looked at here are pure equilibria of the underlying game. So it's a game in continuous strategies. So the X is continuous, the Y is continuous. And I'm looking at a point X star, Y star. So pure, a, a, a local pure Nash equilibrium. Uh, so you may be considering, you know, uh, distributions over X and distributions over y. And maybe correlated distributions over x, y. That was the thing I was mostly looking at. Like, I understand we don't want mix Nash, right? Uh, but, or maybe, yeah. I don't know. Mix Nash is like sort of asking about like average, right? So like, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if. Anyway. Yeah, so exactly. So yeah, you could be looking at mix Nash, you could be looking at uh, like, like uh, or other correlated distributions. Uh, uh, of course, you have to ask yourself exactly, you have to probably, you know, restrict yourself to some low complexity distribution of Rx and Ys because otherwise uh, 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 it is not clear how to represent it, uh, right? So, uh, but, but yeah, certainly, uh, I mean, depending on the underlying application, you may be okay uh, looking at uh, distributions, right? And um, yeah. Right, so you know, if you're okay, for example, to have a distribution over generators that generate an image, uh, then uh, you know, um, I haven't thought about the complexity of the problem. I mean, I'm imagine, I'm ima I imagine it's very hard. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I'm, I'm imagining what happens if you, right? I, I, 
like most most of my understanding of like thinking about two players doing gradient descent is like arguing that the distribution they approach is like a correlated equilibrium, right? As opposed to thinking about it like directly approaching some kind of mixed mass or something. So yeah so uh yeah indeed so like uh like in my in my in my picture where you you know your online gradient descent ascent goes around as a distribution uh like the average is a distribution and uh you can argue that the values of the players uh, 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 on average uh hit the min max value of the game uh, right, so the even though like sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Like we're playing rock paper scissors, right? So I play rock, you play paper. We I switch to whatever. Like at any point in time, my paper is one and yours is minus one, or vice versa, right? Uh, but on average, uh, I get zero and you get zero. So this is what so no regret learning solve rock paper scissors by cycling through the strategies. Uh, and the question is, you know, are you okay sucking through the studies or, you know, uh, hitting the one third, one third, one third uh, Nash equilibrium of, of, that, of that problem? Uh, and uh, yeah, so it depends on the application, you know, whether or not you would be willing to do one or the other. Yeah. Okay, great. So I think we're a little bit over time, so I don't want to hold uh, anyone in the um, audience. So thanks for the, the fantastic talk. Um, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good seeing you.